Today we are speaking with Dr. Dawn St. John, who is a somatic relational psychotherapist, workshop leader, and author of the award-winning book, Healing the Wounds of Childhood, and his latest book, Healing the Wounds of Childhood and Culture, An Adventure of a Lifetime. He is also an authorized continuum teacher and Heller Work Structural Integration practitioner and trainer. He has taught and given presentations across the U.S., Canada, New Zealand, and even Brazil. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to join. I like that photo that's showing, though, the ocean behind you. Yeah, this was in Fort Bragg. So it's a coast off California. It's, it's really beautiful. Mm. Yeah, I love the California coast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're spoiled here for sure. All righty. Let's go ahead and start off. Can you share some maybe key moments from your childhood that significantly impacted your mental health? In relationships in adulthood? Uh, I can, but it would probably take, oh, two or three days to get <laughs> to that. So, you know, let, let me say that I had an unusually challenging childhood from, you know, traumas like almost dying at birth, a whole lot of violence, you know, physical abuse, emotional abuse. It wasn't anything that I would wish on anyone. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was tough. And as I look back in retrospect, I'm also grateful because... You know, had all that not occurred, I wouldn't have taken this adventure, this healing adventure that I call an adventure of a lifetime. And, you know, I I began working on myself almost 60 years ago. I'm 81 as of last week. And, you know, life is is great i mean is it's really it's really rich and full and meaningful and again at 81 i'm teaching fluid movement to folks your age you know in their 30s and 40s and 50s so i've come a long long way over these last 60 years of you know from the time i realized that I needed help, that I was not going down a very good road. Until now, I've learned one or two things and have been able to help, I think, a few people. And that's been very satisfying. Can you tell us maybe about some of the success stories and some of the folks that you've worked with? Uh, Yeah, I mean... You know, Valerie, the way I see it is, let let me give you a broader picture and then we can zero in on specifics, okay? For sure. The way I see it is that humanity as a whole is on an evolutionary journey and that we are on this earth to evolve. And we could say evolve spiritually, evolve psychologically, evolve relationally, evolve somatically. We're we're on this earth to move in that direction of wholeness, the end point of which is pretty unknown. I, I, you know, there have been people, you know, Jesus comes to mind as someone who is pointing towards, you know, where it's all going and in how he defined himself, you know, as, as one with the Father. And I think, you know, our recognizing our own divinity is maybe the end point of that journey, but it's, there's a long, long, long way to go. I think most of us, you know, I talk about four different pillars. I mentioned them somatically, meaning our connection to our own body. 
the, the more deeply I can connect with myself somatically, the more deeply I can connect with you. And psychologically, the, you know, there's so much work that we can all do to give ourselves more freedom, more a better sense of ourselves and who we are a greater capacity to connect with other people yeah like that so i think we're all on this journey some of us are working with it and attempting to move it along and others well they're taking their time a little bit more but we'll all get there one of these days that's kind of how i see it yeah absolutely i love that you mentioned that because it's interesting when we think about being one with ourselves it definitely makes a lot of sense in order to connect i think more intimately with other people so i really appreciate that you've mentioned that and especially i also love that you mentioned that life is just a continuous journey and kind of as they say like we want to enjoy the journey. And I, cause I think a lot of us get caught up in thinking about the destination. We need to get to the destination rather than approaching life is that it's just, a, it's going to be a continuous journey of growth. So I, I appreciate that you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. It's a continuous journey of growth. And I think an important part of that growth growth is is recognizing what the superficial layers of our personality are you know as as we grow up as we get into adolescence we kind of put together our outfits you know what we show the world what we present to the world who we think we are who we think we're not okay and we call this an identity, you know, our sense, our very sense of ourself. And I'll tell you a little story that captures for me what I call the wound of identity. And the story goes like this. Once upon a time, there was this pride of lions, and they were roaming, you know, through the woods, and a big, big storm came along and a baby a baby lion got separated from the pride and got lost and the next day the little baby lion was found by a herd of goats and the goats took the lion in and raised it and so this little baby lion as it was growing up you know, bleated like a goat, walked like a goat, thought he was a goat. Until one day, this big male lion was roaming the woods and comes upon this herd of goats and sees among them this young lion. And he realized what had happened. So he goes down and takes the lion by the scruff of the neck and takes him down to the river and has him look. And, you know, that moment of self-awareness, that realization, he's not a goat, he's a lion. And it, I think that's what happens with most human beings. We have a very limited sense of who we are. And we're so much more, we're so much more lovable. We're so much stronger. We're so much more resilient. We're so much more can be, so much more receptive than we think, than we act. And I think, you know, I think relationship is the venue in which we can uncover those previously unknown aspects and dimensions of ourselves that we can become th that full human being that we're designed to become. Okay. That's beautifully worded. I, I love that. And kind of thinking about that, 
It's interesting. We we hear so many similar stories, just a, similar as to the one that you just mentioned. Like if you have a cat that is, in a sense, a kitten raised by a dog, the cat, you know, starts kind of mirroring the, well, I, I must be a dog too. And it's interesting when we kind of think about the whole like nature versus nurture debate. And it kind of sounds like it might be being kind of true to ourselves. I, I think, and especially in our upbringings, it might, it sounds like it might have more of a, a nurture effect, like how we're kind of raised versus like what we're born and predisposed to be. Yeah, you know, that from the very beginning, those two forces are interacting, yeah. nature and nurture. You know, from the very beginning, the quality of the womb that we just stayed in, the the degree of tranquility versus anxiety in the pregnant mother begins to affect the embryo, the fetus, from the very beginning. So it's really challenging to try and tease out. I mean, there are numerous studies, you know, and as far as I remember anyway, they've never been conclusive one way or another. And the most accurate conclusion is just what I said, that these two forces are interacting all along the way. But I think we can say, and I think we can say, safely say, that most human beings have far more potential than they manifest. And especially, especially in the area of receiving and expressing love. Okay? You know, it's it's not an easy thing to talk about because most of us, you know, we believe we love our family, our our spouse, our children, our parents, and yet, yet, how many people genuinely feel it, genuinely feel in their hearts just love and how often right? yeah, I appreciate something- that you mentioned that because I was just kind of thinking about that because for me personally I know like people will say I love you at the end of the phone call or just you know on a day-to-day basis and not to say that it's not true but I think in a way we're it's kind of conditioned and for me it's always been like pertinent to be like okay I'm I really want to be in a moment where I'm really feeling that love. And so when I say it, I truly mean it rather than just, you know, I'm conditioned it to say at the end of a phone call or at the end of the day, or when I say bye to somebody or, or at anything like that, I think it's just like those words have always like been so powerful to me. And I want to say it when I truly, truly mean it. So I love that you mentioned that. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying, you know, to, those moments, and, and there are moments, I think most of us feel it. Yeah. You know? And I think most of us, because of well, many factors, one of which is the, the early woundings yeah. that we've received that result in our defending our hearts, you know? And I think part of that wounding is the level of comprehension in our culture. Uh, let, let, me, let me elaborate on, on that a, a little bit. I think the understanding of what it means to be human and why we're on this earth has a long way to evolve. You know, we still assume that we're these separate beings playing a zero-sum game in which, you know, the less you have, the more I can have. 
or the less I have, the more you'll have, rather than there's enough for all of us. And we can share and we can, you know, prosper and we can live in a state of abundance, an abundance of love, an abundance of physical necessities, an abundance of friendship. We have a long way to go to to arrive at that state of consciousness. Yeah. And I love that because I think so many folks are kind of like in that competitive mindset. And I'm actually part of a great group of friends, call each other the the dream team. And it's it's as you mentioned, it's about uplifting one another and kind of manifesting that abundance as to like if one of us does well then it's kind of like a domino effect that the rest of us will do well and kind of having that mentality of uplifting each other rather than okay as you mentioned if i'm not doing well and this person's doing well or if i'm doing well and they're not doing so well we kind of have that mindset as if one of us is doing well, it's like an adult, like a ripple effect. And we all can do well and we're all lifting one another. And I think definitely, as you mentioned, like we have a long way to go to like to kind of spread that to the rest of the world and kind of be able to bring more awareness to that. I I love that. That that says to me that you and your friends are functioning at a higher level of consciousness than the majority of the world. And even, even the name of, of your podcast, you know, A Slice of Empathy. Empathy is, is one of those qualities that, that can be available everywhere and anywhere, free of charge. And there's such a deficit of empathy in the world. Yeah. And so that tells me, Valerie, that, you know, you're among those who are leading the way. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I, I try, of course, I'm not perfect. I'm always striving to do better. But yeah, I think like with my, my group of friends, um, you know, of course, we still have difficulties and we try to support each other the best way we can. But I think what kind of sets us apart is that we're not stuck in that negative negative mindset. We're always kind of in the mindset that things are going to be better. And I think it's hard for a lot of folks to kind of to get there. But I, I think there's definitely a lot of potential more work to be done and kind of like bringing more awareness to how not necessarily that, you know, we're happy all the time, but I think the way we kind of go about giving our energy to different things in our lives can kind of like set that precedent to like what kind of day or week or month type of relationships that we have. Yes, I agree. And, you know, it's a process. It's a work. You you said you're not perfect. I don't know if anyone is perfect. I don't know what that means, but it's a direction. It's a direction, it's, it's a shift from that competitive scarcity mindset, yeah. a mindset that says there is not enough. There's, you know, it goes with a sense of deprivation. It, it can result in greed and the accumulation of stuff, you know, toys, money, real estate, just more, 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 and never having that emptiness really filled because what's needed, what's wanted is connection and love and meaning and the reality of abundance, you know, abundance is a mindset that's based in reality. Most of what we need comes free of charge. We need human connection. We need air. 
We need water. Okay. We need food. Okay, there's the first payment, food. Yeah. But, you know, we, we don't need billions and billions and still feel like it's not quite enough because somebody else has more, you know? And, and that mindset exists throughout the culture. Yeah, that's so true. And kind of thinking about that, especially when we think about accumulating stuff, whether, you know, whether it's like, as you mentioned, like real estate or tangible items, I, I think so many people struggle with it. And even though maybe they, maybe they have money or they have a lot of stuff or whatever it is, they have a, the big house or they have a, a big boat, they're still in a way like there's something missing and you're kind of perpetually stuck in this mindset because you're caught trying to kind of fill this void and these tangible things aren't really satisfying that and satisfying that that need and i and i love that you mentioned connection because i think that's so true for for pretty much everyone and when we look dig deeper when we realize that the things that we have aren't actually fulfilling us and and i think that also requires a deeper level of self awareness and, and understanding to before we can maybe truly realize what it is that we're missing. Yes, agreed. And, and you know, again, connection is necessary from the moment we're born until the moment we pass. And it it's a reality. We we don't exist alone. We can exist alone. You know, and we shouldn't act as if we can't. You know, the emphasis on being self sufficient and self reliant to a degree that's important. You know, an adolescent is learning to become self sufficient, he, he or she is learning to get ready to step out in the world. But it's always in a context of relationship. And that is important to recognize and privilege. Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of want to dive into your writing and how that has maybe helped facilitate your he healing process and your journey towards writing the healing wounds of childhood. Can you take us maybe along that process, how that's been a healing journey for you? Let's kind of go from there. Sure. I needed a great deal of healing. For example, in the area of relationships, looking back, I would say that in my early adulthood, I was relationally retarded. You know, I had three marriages and three divorces in the first 15 years of my adulthood. And physically, I had very low energy. I was getting serious headaches with nausea and throughout my childhood into my adulthood and so on just about every level, I was very highly challenged. And you now, once I began, I, I started with traditional psychotherapy and then realized that my body had to be attended to as well. So I began studying some of the somatic disciplines, took courses in relationships. I mean, everywhere I could improve, I went for it. And realized, realized that even though my situation could be considered rather extreme in terms of the necessity for healing, in terms of the extent 
of trauma and abuse, I realized that most human beings were wounded and most human beings you know, could be on a healing journey. And then I concluded, you know, as going along this trail, then I concluded that that's why we're here. That's why we're on this earth, to heal in the sense of becoming whole, in the sense of manifesting the potential that we have, in the sense of recognizing that, for example, Our bodies are approximately 70% liquid, water. Mm -hmm. The atoms in our body are some 99% space. And that those two facts have implications for existence. We can feel fluid. And fluid is resilient, absorbent, strong. We can feel spacious. We can radiate light. We can touch people with love just by our presence. And that's why I wrote and revised my book. I love that. I really appreciate those detailed insights. And I'll definitely be checking that out as well. How would you say that your relationships have evolved as you've progressed through this journey? Great question. Well, my wife and I are both 81 years old. We've been together now. This is our 40th year. Wow, amazing. Yeah, and what's even more amazing is that it's still vital it it's still vibrant it's emotionally intimate i don't think i have a single secret that i've kept from her we can get down and really talk about what's going on and topics that would terrify some people to get into we can do it and it's it's wonderful there's a sense of you know both individuality and real closeness something i couldn't even dream about 50 years ago 60 years ago when i was first an adult so the the evolution in my relationship world my relationship life is probably one of the most dramatic places where my life has changed. And it's changed through a whole lot of work in those areas that I talked about, my connection to my body, my my exploration of my psyche over decades, you know, finding out what's really there. What do I believe to be true. See, most people walk around believing that they're not quite good enough. Yeah, so true. That yeah, that that you know and and this sense of deficiency is like a hole in the soul that gets covered with some personality mechanism okay, that allows us to navigate in the world. But to really be touched, to really feel whole, we we have to get underneath that mechanism. That mechanism might be a, a nice guy or a very rational, you know, quality, and get to the wound that's there, get to that sense of deficiency and have our essence, our truth revealed. That's incredibly inspiring. I love that you, that you shared that. And it's funny, I've actually, I've been with my husband for 18 years and married for 16. So hopefully one day I can say we've been together for so many, so many years and, it's still um, wonderful. 
Yeah. Um, 18 it's, years. That's good for you. Yeah. And um, it, it, as you mentioned, it's uh, it definitely has taken a lot of work to kind of reach a level where we have a lot of healthy communication about a variety of different things. Uh, we mm-hmm. can tell each other everything. And I hope for our, our listeners who may be going through something that they can realize that there is still hope for anyone who is looking for a long-term healthy relationship, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I love that you shared that with us. And it's funny because when I was younger, I had taken some psychology courses as well, mainly marriage and family relationships and child development. And it was incredibly eye-opening and informative to me and helpful. And then, of course, throughout the years, I've read a lot self-help type books. One that I really enjoyed, I think it was The Myth of Normal by Gamor Mate. Great book. One um, of my favorites, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing book for anyone who has experienced any type of trauma, especially within the family. It's a very detailed book about how like it starts from like so yeah i really appreciate that you said you you said that incredibly inspiring and kind of like leaning into that how have your relationships kind of evolved as you've kind of progressed down this journey well i think you know i think the there are a couple of different ways that i can answer that one is that You know how when your partner gets upset and snaps at you, you ever have that experience? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you said that because (laughs) just about everyone does. (laughs) Well, the the thing that most of us do is we snap back. Yep, absolutely. (laughs) Guilty. Right? Yeah. We We get angry back. And now that is inevitable. That just happens in about every relationship, at least in the first 20 years. Now, the key is not to let it escalate. You know, in relationships that are challenging, that begins quickly escalates into, you know, a dragged out fight that can take hours or sometimes days, you know, to re to restore harmony. And, and the key is, you know, you can make it a game to see how quickly you can let go of the upset and return to equilibrium within yourself. Then if there's something to deal with, you can deal with it, but not when you're angry, not when you're upset and, you know, losing it. Okay. So that's, that's one. And to get to the point, here's the real goal to get to the place where when your partner gets upset with you and snaps at you, you stay centered and you don't get upset back. Yeah, I I definitely think that's a, a work in progress. I think so many people <laughs> struggle with that. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. true. Like as if it escalates, it's it's not going to lead it anywhere productive. And I think it's definitely a moment to pause if maybe in that moment that you need a a little bit of space to kind of calm down before you come back yeah. to the conversation. But yeah, like I, when we were, my husband and I were, were much younger and immature. And yeah, I think, I think it's like, it's, it's a, a lot of work to be able to get to that point to where you kind of remain centered, as you say, and be able to kind of take a step back because our, our first inclination is to snap back. And it's interesting. Like I know for us, what's really helped is. And it's something that we're, I think we're always working on and is a work in progress is to, if there's something that is bothering us to kind of stop and think about how 
we approach it, if, if especially, especially if there's something that is bothering us and lay it out in a way to where, I don't know, for example, like my husband's on his phone a lot. And instead of saying something like, hey, you're all that you, you know, you're constantly on your phone da, 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 and kind of coming across like, like critical. Yeah, exactly. And it, 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 yeah, as you mentioned, like a lot of times, like my husband, his feedback would be like, oh, well, I just feel like you're criticizing me. And, and, and it, and kind of changing that approach to be like, hey, can we maybe make a night a week where, you know, we don't have any electronics and we're just, we have a date night and we're just focused on chatting with each other or watching a movie or, or whatever it is, rather than just like, yeah, coming across as just critically, you're doing this and you're doing that. And it, it's just going to elicit kind of more of a defense reaction. So I love that you mentioned that. Right. Good work. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always uh, like a you work in progress. It. <laughs> you're at you're asking for what you want you know and getting to the the point of what you want which is more time with him rather than criticizing what he's doing yeah so that's why i say good work <laughs> yeah thank you and i definitely think it the response is is definitely different when you approach it that way versus approaching it in like a like a way of criticism. Yes. And I was kind of thinking for maybe someone who is just maybe starting their healing journey when it comes to childhood trauma, what's a, a word of advice to someone who's maybe gotten to the point of recognizing that they're kind of unpacking this trauma and wanting to move forward with self-improvement? Well, I think if one can remember that those wounds, those traumas, those hurts okay, are the stuff out of which we can make gold in our lives okay, that shifts the orientation from one of poor me, self-pitying or feeling like a victim to feeling more like an alchemist. Okay? This is the stuff that I've been given. You know, I am literally my mother began swinging at me, you know, open hand, but swinging when I was 11 months old. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, I could pity myself for the rest of my life or, you know, I developed a strength to not be afraid. I developed the skills to speak to what I need and to establish boundaries. Okay? That's the goal. That, that's what we can evolve from those wounds. So it's an important gift of perspective. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I like that you mentioned boundaries in particular, because actually I think that was one of the first things that I actually started to work on like post-childhood trauma. And it's interesting when my therapist had identified it, mm. it basically was had said, your family, like there was just like no boundaries in your family. And at that time, I didn't really quite understand what that meant. And it, it kind of took me kind of getting out of that to realize that, wow, that that's, that's a lot to unpack. That is that there's a lot of truth in being able to kind of learn how to implement them. And that's probably been maybe a 10 or 15 year <laughs> work in progress as well. <laughs> Yes, it is definitely a working, you know, as I said, I'm 81 years old. Doesn't mean I've arrived, you know, it's still a work, it's still a process of, you know, awakening, developing, letting go. Yeah. The other advice I'd give Valerie is to read my book. I think it's a good overview of how we're affected 
and, and what can be done about it. Absolutely. And, and so many people, so many people will will say something like, you know, I I don't know why I suffer. I don't know why I have such challenges in relationships. My my childhood was normal. Okay, tell me about it. Tell me how things were, you know. Well, my mother, you know, she was depressed for the first two years after I was born. And yeah, my father drank a lot, but only on Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. And yeah, he was pretty different on the weekends. Hard to be around. You know, they start telling you these things that are highly traumatic, painful experiences that they endured but never registered that they were wounded by those experiences i had a have a friend who 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 used to say to me i had a pretty easy childhood there was no problems in my childhood and and then He started telling me about these dreams he was having. And in the dreams, there was this profound sorrow. I was like, yeah, where do you think that come from? (laughs) You know, he began to realize that, yeah, there was a lot of sorrow in his childhood, that he didn't have the support, the resources to experience and process. So, you know, he did what? human beings do he he covered it over you know with with a narrative that all was well and had a smile on his face right yeah and i I think it's a struggle for so many people and and especially in a situation like that because we might be arriving to therapy and not really realizing that we had trauma or maybe you know, we, when we think of trauma, we're thinking something to a different level, especially when I think trauma is minimized. When you think, oh, well, this person had it way worse, you know, they were sexually abused or, or different things like that. There's a degree of minimalizing the experience. And so so by default, you're kind of thinking, okay, well, my childhood wasn't so bad. And so when you're kind of work, we kind of when you arrive at that point before you unpack, it's like, okay, well, I why am I here? Why I I, I don't think my childhood was bad, and I I've definitely heard of scenarios like that, and 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 I've talked with people that have had similar experiences, and and kind of like for my husband, for for an example, had a pretty normal childhood growing up and and that's what he told when we one of the things when we first met but his dad passed away when he was 16 and he had to move in with his mom who wasn't really emotionally available and his stepdad that didn't really treat him well and it didn't take him until more somewhat more recently to kind of realize the how that impacted him Mm -hmm. Uh, and some of the things that he he kind of will look back on it now and realize, yeah, my mom wasn't really emotionally available. That impacted me more than I thought it would, especially, you know, his dad who raised him since he was 16 passed away and he's so young. And so it's interesting, kind of like when we, when we kind of dive deeper and kind of think about these sorts of scenarios. Another one is my, my mom, my, my grandparents had divorce during a time where it still wasn't really socially acceptable to have a divorce. And my mom said that she was 11 when they divorced. And she, in a way, was kind of the caretaker for my grandmother, who was dealing with a lot of depression. And and it's interesting because we've had this conversation to where she said, you know, to, to me, it was just normal. I wasn't upset at her, upset with her about it or anything like that. It was just kind of life. And so I kind of, when I was talking to her, I'm like, so there's, I was kind of curious because I'm like, wow, that would bother many people, maybe resentment or kind of feeling like maybe your childhood was taken away. And so that's kind of something, it was kind of a conversation that kind of opened up that maybe she didn't really think about that maybe had Mm -hmm. had a subconscious impact 
on her life, even at the time when she's like, oh, well, you know, I didn't really mind. Or I'm like, yeah, but you were like kind of a parentified, you know, child at the time. So it must have had some sort of impact. <laughs> you know, that that is so common. Yeah. It is so you know, statistically, you'd have to say it's normal. Yeah. Because I think the great majority of people do something like that. Now, here's the thing. All right, let's say you're 12 years old when your parents divorce. That means for sure you were seven years old when things started going bad. Because parents, you know, people don't get divorced uh, until things have gone bad for a good while, usually several years. So that means the environment in the household had a lot of negativity. And we're affected by that negativity. Only That's the only environment that we know. Yeah. So we don't say, oh, this is terrible. I'm, you know, we simply pardon the edges, the, the covering around our heart for example, and we develop a model in our minds about relationships, a model of relationships and how, well, they really can't be trusted. They go sour. You know, men will do this to you. Women will do that to you. All of that is developing in that process that seems normal to the individual right and and it's interesting i i know you kind of mentioned about the the victim kind of mindset too because i think so many people get soured and and i think in the process of resentment they they develop these sorts of biases as to well, well all men are bad or all women are bad or this always happens and and so it's interesting because i think like of course we want to to feel the feelings as they come up. But I think there, there is a, there's a point where it it, it kind of can lead into a, a victim mentality and an obsession. And you, then you don't ever quite process, like you don't ever kind of, you, you never get to really move beyond those feelings. You're kind of just stuck there, focused on all the negativity. And then it kind of projects outward. And then, and then that's all you can see in your life is negativity. Everything is bad. And, and in, and in a way, like, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy because then you feel like that's the only thing that comes your way is negativity versus if you are able to kind of process this emotion and acknowledge it and, and are able to kind of move beyond it. Yeah, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It does become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? That's that's the importance of doing our work. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to know what impact do you hope that your books and personal story uh, will have on readers and our listeners? Here's, here's the primary thing I hope for is that people who come across my book or who hear me in a podcast learn that this journey, okay, that this healing journey is really an adventure. It, it's amazing. It's wonderful. It's challenging. It can be difficult. It can be frightening. But it's, for me, it's the greatest game in town. You know, because otherwise, it all depends on what was put into us through our childhood, because we simply live out those scripts, we live out those beliefs, we live out those expectations, and we don't go beyond them unless we begin to examine them and challenge them and recognize that there is so much more that's possible 
regardless of the hand you were dealt with. As I said, what I was dealt with was no joke, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. But to be able to take what you were dealt with and just transmute it into gold is an adventure of a lifetime. I love that you mentioned that. And I love that you mentioned adventure of a lifetime because it really is. I don't think there is ever an ending point for healing, especially when navigating trauma. It's, It's a lifetime journey of navigating that and working to constantly evolve as humans and improve the the best way we know how is with what we are dealt with, as you mentioned. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. And before we close out, can you maybe share with us maybe your current projects or future plans related to mental health and healing? Well, Remember, Valerie, I'm 81 years old, (laughs) so future plans, well, occasionally the thought of writing another book comes to mind, but I have not committed to that. I am teaching continuum classes, continuum, I call it consciousness through movement, And it's a a way of deepening our sense of ourselves through movement in our bodies. And it's usually quite subtle and quite slow and meditative, except when it isn't. I am teaching those workshops. My book is titled Healing the Wounds of Childhood and Culture subtitled An Adventure of a Lifetime, and it's on Audible, so if you prefer to listen rather than read, that's possible. Yeah, I think that's that's it, and I like to hopefully spend more and more time not doing anything. Oh, I can totally understand that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's totally understandable. And I'll definitely be checking out your, your book as well. I'm very intrigued. It's right up my alley as I continue to reflect and self-improve. Can you also share with our listeners maybe where they can learn more uh, by your book, learn more about your classes, uh, connect with you? Yes, my website. And it also has my email. You could send me an email via my website. And it's www.patsofconnection.com. Pats of Connection, P A T H S O F C O N N E C T I O N. Pats of Connection.com. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I had such a great conversation and I'm always learning and strive to continue to improve my relationships and all that good stuff. And I'm excited to have our listeners learn more as well. So I'll be sure to keep all that down in the show notes down below so our listeners can connect and learn more about your book and what you do. Um, So I'm super thankful. So thank you so much for for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Valerie. Enjoy this conversation with you. Mm -hmm.